The topic is high power master FM, FM antennas and combiners. Um, historically, antenna combiners are designed and built in separate silos. The antenna parameters are to meet a desired coverage, um, a desired gain in antenna pattern. The channel combiner is to meet the intermod requirements for a certain set of channels with minimum loss. Um, what we've done here is you build, tear down the walls of those silos and attempt to use some of the antenna parameters to simplify the combiner design. And what we ended up with is reduced footprint and cost for a channel combiner for a master FM antenna. Um, the particular site that we're dealing with right now is in Lima, Peru. Um, on the left hand side is population density of Lima. The tower site is a little black X right here. Um, so you can see the population is dispersed to the north and somewhat southeast of Lima. And we've got some mountain valleys that also have some decent uh, population in them. Um, the antenna pattern that we came up with for the problem is here. That's the azimuth pattern. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the signal density map is here showing also the it's fairly mountainous, um, but we have very good coverage. In this case, red is, red is a good thing. Um, it means the, uh, the uh, uh, signal is above 34 dBU per, per meter. Um, and you see we got good coverage of the coastal plain as well as decent penetration to some of the mountain valleys. And of course, if you want to shot the coast of Lima, you can also take your radio. Um, and again, this, this uh, plus Curtis. For Jira. Um, the uh, feed network, um, this is a schematic of the power dividers and um, it's simply it's a, it's a 10, 10 layer array and um, two phases, uh, 0 and 120 phases. And to get that antenna pattern, it's a two thirds power to the north face, um, one third power to the southeast face. Um, um, the important thing to take away here is that this is a dual feed radiator and it's a dual feed antenna and that's one of the features of the antenna that we're going to use to simplify the combiner. The channels that are required for this site are basically 80 to 108 whole um, spectrum and what is interesting is that we've got two sets of channels that are spaced at 600 kilohertz Typically, 800 kilohertz for FM consists the adjacent channel, and all the standard combined techniques are set up to address you know, up to or down to 800 kilohertz spacings. Um, 600 kilohertz is a, a, not a typical um, in the site um, spacing. So we need to do something special for the combined to address that fact. The antenna that we selected to use here is um, called an HDCR, um, the, the dielectric alphabet soup of antennas. Um, this, this means high definition gravity back radiator. That's, that's what those letters mean. Um, and the cavity back rated, these little baskets behind the radiator are, are you know, basically form metallic cavity behind each radiator. Um, this is a relatively old design, um, came up with, with um, at the advent of HD radio to do space combining. Um, it's on air at several major antenna sites, including um, St. Louis and Jacksonville. Um, and the, the schematic is to use one input to the antenna for the analogs and the other input for the digitals. That way you would get isolation between the analog and digital. Uh, what we're going to do in this case is use put one input for um, a first set of channels and the second input, the second four channels, um, in which case we take, let's take other, well, if you list them in frequency, take every other channel and put them in input. So 93 go to input one, 97 three to input one, 106 three to input one, 107 to input one. Um, so basically you end up with even nods to each, each uh, input of the antenna. Now, this schematic shows 
uh, cross dipoles. Um, and you feeding uh, two dipoles out of phase gets you solar polarization. Uh, quick review, one dipole gets you electric polarization. Two dipoles at the 90 degrees get you some form of elliptical polarization. If you happen to be equal amplitude and for FM, 90 degrees out of phase, um, then you get circular polarization. Um, we're going to end up with half the channel is running right-hand circular, and the other half of the channel is running left-hand circular. Um, this antenna here, cross dipoles, is the equivalent of this set of four square loops. Um, I took an antenna course in college. We talked all about dipoles and monopoles and array factors. We, we certainly never covered anything like four square loops fed by two bonds. So I had to study this for a while to figure out why this is a high isolation radiator. That's the fundamental parameter that we're after for this radiator is the isolation between the two inputs. On um, this picture here, we see the, this thing at the bottom is a coaxial hybrid. It has to be folded to get the side down. Uh, so what comes around a couple of are feed these two ports here. These are two coax ports, and these long things here are the balance. Now, when you talk about a balance, at one end you've got a coax, which has an inner and outer. Once you get to the other end, um, you, you don't think of ground in positive anymore. You think of two voltages which are out of phase. At the top of the ballon, um, we take the outer and we tie to one radiator here, one of the loops. We take the inner and jump across and tie it to the diagonal loop. So over here, if we, let's consider that we're going to drive one of these ports only. So that's a driven dipole. Um, so we have one loop at a positive and one loop at a negative. Now you drive that node, and you're looking at two strips, one going this way, one going this way. This is a current device. So we've got current which goes in equal amount on this strip, um, this one half this way, half this way. And on the opposite um, loop, the current's going opposite direction because it's phase, two equal currents going um, to the node. So that's the currents on the driven dipole. Now right hand rule, you got current, you've got a magnetic field going around it. Uh, the um, non-driven dipole, which happens to be right next to it, you've got a current cutting that, you've got a field cutting that loop in the opposite direction, so it induces current in the opposite direction. So the, on the non-driven dipole, we've got a current going to this, the, toward that node. And actually, let, let's consider this, this two here is the second port. Port one is the one we're driving. Port two is the coaxial port that we're not driving. So we've got a current going to the port induced by this current over here. And we've got a current going away from the port induced by this current over here. So what that means is that we apply the voltage here at port one, and at port two, you've got current going into it, that node. So you don't have any voltage across that node generated by the, by the input of the first quadrant port. And that is the reason this is a high isolation radiator. Measured isolation, 8101, it's better than 30. Um, measured visbar, it's also very good, 106. 88 to 108. Um, okay, let's, let's file those facts away for a little while, and I'm going to talk about some channel combined parameters. Um, one of the factors that needs to be considered, actually the most important factor in, in designing a channel combiner, is to get the intermod product generation down to an acceptable level. So, Review third order intermods, high power amplifier fed by the desired frequency. If you apply power from a second frequency to output, the mix in the active component, generate an intermod, uh, third order intermods 2F1 plus F2. Um, minus F2 that we care about because that intermod um, 
is uh, high enough power will interfere with your neighbors in the FM band, and also it will interfere in some instances with or radars. Um, those, you know, the lion's share of interference issues with them um, multiplex sites. So in order to get um, that intermod product down to an acceptable level, flooring is used. Um, this, and this is kind of convenient, that, you know, F2 and 2F1 minus F2 happen to be the same distance from F2, so if the plus and minus 800 kilohertz or 1.6 megahertz, that is the rejection that is important to consider. Uh, this is the filter response, um, which in FM we like to be symmetrical. Um, channel combiner type. Um, on the left-hand side, we see what's known. This, these are both channel combiners. Left-hand side is what's known as a constant impedance combiner, or a CF. Um, it consists of two, two filters, two hybrids, reject load, all the interconnection that goes in between it. On the right-hand side is a schematic, a manifold filter, which consists of three filters, three coaxial teeth, and the plumbing that goes between it. Now, the first thing that's obvious is the amount of parts in the CIF is a lot. The amount of parts in the manifold is not so much. Um, so that clearly a manifold is smaller and cheaper than a CIF ever would be. I would assert that at least 80% of the FM combiners that are out there are constant impedance filters. And the question would be, why is that? It's bigger, it's more expensive. Why would you do that? Um, the, the first answer to the question is that if a broadcast engineer has something that he knows works, and he goes to something new, he's going to buy what he knows works, you're going to do the same thing over again because you're comfortable with it. Um, that is one reason, but there are also more valid reasons um, that a CIF would be preferred. Um, the first and primary one is that you get more isolation with fewer filter sections. Um, it also works very well with tube amplifiers. Uh, so if you have an old tube that you're running, um, uh, the, a CIF isn't easy to put in. It's considered easy to add channels by because it has a broadband port. You can add channels to the broadband port. I would assert it's also just as easy to add a CIF between the manifold and the antenna. It's the same amount of hardware, same amount of work. Um, yeah, it's the uh, CIF is also very good for high powers because the filter takes filter in a CIF is half the time. Um, on the negative side, large expensive visoir insertion loss um, are not necessarily optimized. All the standards. So on the manifold side, we got smaller, less expensive. Um, uh, RF parameters are um, generally pretty good and evenly distributed for all the panels. Um, all has been considered hard to design. Um, I, with modern design software, I think that, that negative goes away. Um, it does require correct phasing to use with amplifiers. Um, if you phase between the, the, the transmitter, the, the filter input correct, um, it, it's okay, it'll work, um, but that is an extra step during installation. Uh, it does limit the power rating, um, anything less than 30 kilowatts. And, or significantly, it requires more filter sections. You receive the same isolation. So that, that would be the reason that, that would be the, the main technical reason that a CIF would be preferred as a combiner. Um, but I'll introduce a few concepts later on which, which mitigate that somewhat. Um, in filter sections, filter sections has a cost, and it is it's an efficiency. So this is the number of poles for filter, two through five. Um, and for various size cavities, large power, medium power, and six inch cavities for uh, one kilowatts of low power. Um, the efficiency numbers are here. Um, two poles are only used for very widely spaced stations. Three and four, like lion's share of what's out there. Um, you pretty much want to avoid five filters at all costs um, because you get a real hit in efficiency relative to the uh, fewer filter sections. Um, again, going back to um, the CIF versus the manifold, the intermod budget, um, the hybrid in a, in a 
in a CIF adds 30 dB of isolation. So that reduces the filter requirements at the added channel to be 25 dB. So that means fewer filter sections. Whereas in a manifold, the filter has a alone, uh, requiring 40 dB to get um, the required. Yeah, the SEC requires 80 dB. Um, the IT has similar requirements for the rest of the world. In South America, there's also 80 dB of, uh, of um, intermod rejection. And what's interesting is that there is a turnaround loss for uh, the transmitter um, that if you power at, at one frequency, the intermod is going to come out attenuated significantly. For two blame amplifiers, that number is always on the order of 6 dB. So it's not if the chemical miner always had to stand on its own in order to get the intermod requirements. For solid state transmitters, um, that number is more on the order of 20 dB. So it, it's kind of intriguing that you know, a solid state transmitter is going to do a lot better. And we could use that number to reduce the requirements on in the number of filter sections required for a channel combiner. Um, this is the same slide as before in chart form. Um, you add it all up, you get 100 dB, so it's well over the requirement if you include that on loss. Now, let's go back to our antenna that we have input, and we've got good isolation. If we add up, um, we do the same math for the intermod requirements and we include the antenna isolation, we can get 25 dB from the filter rejections and you can get 25 dB, we'll get, we can get to 30, but we're going to count 25. 25 from the antenna isolation. Um, turnaround loss, again, 20 dB. That all sums up to be well over the 80 dB requirement. So having the antenna isolation makes sense in order to meet the intermod requirements. So this dramatically can, simplif can dramatically simplify the channel combiner design. Um, the other feature I want to talk about, which will get you to fewer filter sections, is the use of cross-coupling. Um, cross-coupling in filters um, was initiated in the satellite industry in the early 70s. And it's its way through wireless and television. And it is used sporadically in FM channel combiners. Um, see on the left hand side is actually a three pole filter with a cross coupling, which will produce a response with two transmission zeros, which is what you want. You want a symmetric response. It's kind of interesting because it is, it's unusual to get two transmission zeros out of a three pole filter. Um, this uses what's known as a source to three cross coupling, where we take a coaxial T and put it on the input and feed a coupling structure inside the third cavity that will generate two transmission zeros, which gets you to an increased rejection requirement, increased rejection on only a three pole filter. So you can use the lower loss of a three pole filter in that improved efficiency for a certain set of channels. Um, just as an comparison, here's a Chevy Chev. Um, you can get 25 dB at 800 kilohertz, um, only 15 at 600 kilohertz. Now, our 600 kilohertz requirement for a particular site, we need 25. So we introduce a four pole with cross coupling, and we've got, um, in this case, with the transmission zero right there, you've got 41. Um, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll say that's more than 25. And you still have better than 25 at the 800 kilohertz. So we, we've got meet the requirement for both of those channel spacings with a four pole cross coupling. Um, so this kind of compares the Chebyshev filter with the cross coupled filter. So three of the cross and four of the cross. Um, what's interesting is that if you use in a manifold, you were limited to 2.6 megahertz spacing, three pole. Um, you can reduce that now to 1.6 if you introduce that cross coupling. The Chebby Chev um, was limited to 1.6 megahertz. Now you can cover the 800 kilohertz spacing uh, with a cross coupling. And in this particular instance, we're going to use it for 600 kilohertz. Um, manifold design um, all has been considered kind of hard. 
Um, but we, we did an experiment a few years ago where we, we took a whole series of low power filters and just to see if we could do a 10 channel manifold and, and, and we certainly could. Um, the nice thing about FM is that uh, the bandwidth of the filters is pretty narrow in terms of percent. So you, you can do a lot of things that, that is harder with wider filters. Um, so here's 10 channels all optimized better than 30 dB um, return loss. So no one suffers a, a reduced um, VSWR value by the fact that they are downstream from a lot of other modules. Um, the other fact is that the insertion loss is all within a tenth of a dB for every single channel in the chain. Um, these are the measured values here for that. You know, these are relatively high because it's only a six inch cavity. Um, but it would be comparable with bigger cavities, they'd be on the order of 0.2 dB. Um, what, what's important here is that these are all within a tenth of a dB. Now, if we were to do a constant impedance filter with the same size filter, you, your first module, which was adjacent to the antenna, would probably enjoy a 0.65 dB loss. But as a rule of thumb, you've got to add 0.05 dB per module that it has to go to to get to the antenna. So if you're at the end of this combiner, not treated fairly compared to your neighbor who was at the, the, at the antenna position, um, you get quite a significant deviation in insertion loss. In terms of you turn that into efficiency, that's a variation of, of more than 10%. Um, so that, that's not something you want to do. You pay a lot of money for an efficient transmitter. You pay a lot of money for power. You don't want to throw it away on some silly hunk of metal sitting in your transmitter room. Um, all right, for Lima, um, this is uh, how we distributed the channels. Um, these set of four channels are assigned to input one, the minor one. Uh, this set of four channels is assigned to combiner two. Now, in the combiner, we've got spacings, which are 4.2, 1.4, very widely spaced channels in the combiner. Um, the smallest being 1.4. Now, across combiner, um, between the two combiners, the spacing is where all the these space channels are. That means that you know, we're using that antenna isolation um, to meet the intermod requirements between the two channel combiner sets. Um, and this is how we designed the uh, filters for each station. Um, so the conclusions are um, manifold combiners are less expensive and they're smaller. And where you can use them, you really should try to use them. Um, and certainly solid state transmitters having a turnaround loss of 20 dB is largely ignored. You use that. Uh, if you Considered that fact in their mod calculation, um, you could certainly meet the 80 dB even with some margin, but you may be able to reduce the number of filter sections, and take that efficiency gain. Um, and uh, thirdly, in this instance, a full feed antenna with good isolation between the radiators um, dramatically helps save floor space and uh, in work costs.